Forensic focus coverage of standardization in digital forensics continues this week by exploring CASE, the Cyber Investigation Analysis Standard Expression, an extension of the unified cyber ontology, which defines classes of cyber objects in relation to one another, their provenance and actions. CASE is an international standard supporting automated combination, validation, and analysis of cyber investigation information in any context, including criminal, corporate, and intelligence. To tell us more, including what it all means and how to get involved, this week the Forensic Focus podcast welcomes Owen Casey, who hardly needs an introduction, but for today is representing as the presiding director on the Case Community Governance Committee. I'm your podcast host, Krista Miller. Welcome, Owen. Thank you, Krista. Thank you for having me. So to start with, if you would please walk us through what the case and the UCO are, their implications for tool interoperability and advanced analysis, and beyond that, this culture of common comprehension and collaborative problem solving that you've mentioned, how is case contributing to the effort to improve the quality of digital forensic science, make it more evaluative? Well, th there's a number of parts and, and also case and UCO fit uh, quite a range of uh, needs that we, we've had for a long time in the in the cyber investigation community. So from the interoperability standpoint, fundamentally, when we're dealing with data from different sources and processing it using different tools, there's a bit of hand, hand kind of jamming or putting it into spreadsheets or formats that we can put, put together that's error, error prone and not particularly repeatable or consistent. And so by automating a lot of the normalization and combination of the data, we increase efficiency, we bring those multiple data sources together uh, more consistently and allow the practitioners to spend more time analyzing the data and less time mm. just put, piecing it together. And fun, what you mentioned provenance, that, that's built in and really kind of baked in in the two case, a fundamental portion of our structure is to allow for tracking who operated on digital evidence when, what actions were performed during an investigation, uh, even where. And so that's a, a chain of evidence that allows us to make, make I think, uh, more concrete or at least uh, traceable uh, back to source and authentication of the evidence mm -hmm. in sometimes in an automated fashion and, and filling some of the gaps that currently exist through, through just paper documentation or, or let's say less routine and systematic documentation. One of the other areas in, in terms of quality is tool validation. And, and it, this auto, the automation of some of the tool outputs and comparison against known ground truth really will, I think, make a big difference for validation and ultimately the quality of uh, digital forensic science. So how so, because I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of um, accreditation efforts in the UK and elsewhere, um, sort of the broader conversation around standardizing digital forensics processes and practices. So um, like uh, just on a practical level, how, how do you um, envision that working? Well, it's more than envisioning. So in fact, there was a recent, uh, this year there was a funded focused effort to, in the UK to show a proof of concept automated tool validation using case. So it took okay. some commercial tools with ground truth data sets that were run through a process that used case as the, uh, the layer of, let's say standardization, mm -hmm. and where you can take ground truth representation and compare it with the output of your tool automatically, you're really taking a lot of the manual labor out of that and some, and, and some of the time also that it saves is important. But you can do this on a then routine basis as new versions of tools arise, you have the same ground truth data set and you can compare the new output or the output of the new version of the tool automatically against the ground truth and see if there are any differences. So that's happening now. It's something that's being kind of built out more in an operational context in the UK given the importance uh, now of uh, some, some of these issues that have arisen in the past years. Okay, okay. Um, I have to admit, as a non-practitioner, um, it, it's still a little bit abstract for me. Um, it, just from a standpoint of using a tool interface for collection analysis and reporting, um, can you give us some examples of case objects or facets and the types of information they represent? And from there, the value to different sectors, um, public sector, law enforcement, private, academic, or commercial vendors? Sure. and. 
really from the user interface standpoint, it's kind of ideally behind the scenes okay. up to the point where it's exporting or importing data uh, to, cr to create this interoperability or to generate reports that can then be processed through, through some systematic way. Okay. So if you look at autopsy as an example, there's a report generation option there that you can export some of the file system information out in case UCO format. And what that provides is some of the file system objects and metadata and their context in the, in the forensic image. But then what you start to, I think, see is you're not just dealing with pieces of metadata. You're not just dealing with an individual date timestamp or an individual file name. They are in context. And so if you have uh, an, a file, it's, let's say a Outlook PST file, that inside of it, it has email messages. And ultimately that's uh, you know, parsed out to give you the headers with some email uh, to and from addresses. You're not just getting an email address as an entity in your, in your data. You're seeing an email address and its context within the to or the from within the context of the wrappers that's around. And so you might, by maintaining its, its structural context, you can perform more powerful analysis hmm. uh, where you can see email that in email addresses coming in different, let's say from different contexts, but still be able to correlate them. And so you have this contextual analysis and even it's, it's a graph based representation. So even this link node analysis that allows for very powerful, uh, let's say more advanced analysis and visualization. So that structure is the key. And it's what case is, it's ontology based. So it right. provides this, uh, this conceptual structure that allows for more advanced analysis on the data. Okay. Based on the case website, um, I saw a handful of commercial vendors along with some of the open source tools. You mentioned Autopsy, um, as well as the NIST and SRL have adopted or are in the process of adopting case. In what ways and um, have any independent tool developers signed on? So there's a range of uh, yeah, developers. You see most of the community is coming from organizations that yeah. either make tools or use use tools in our in our uh, domain. Some independent developers are involved, but we're looking for more. One of the, I guess, key elements here is that there's a, there's a collaboration across all the sectors to try and find a balance between this, this structural, let's say, integrity, the, the, the data as it in its context, but then the use of so making it practical. And that's where we're really starting to pull together this, this coming uh, few months is really going to be a time where we're pulling together the adopters and the developers okay. to cross that kind of, I think, threshold of making it much more usable and providing tooling to, to facilitate implementation. Yeah, but it, one of the things that's helping is some organizations, so customers of the commercial tool vendors, some organizations are now requiring this type of interoperability so that they can liberate their data and take the data from a variety of commercial tools and, and other open source and GOTS tools and be able to use the data for their purposes and not have it uh, kind of stove, stove piped or, or separated into individual, let's say, proprietary uh, repositories. Okay, okay. Um, I want to, I'll, I'll get to the, the different roles. Um, you mentioned adopters and developers, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I want to focus more on the community aspect um, at the moment, um, because this quarter, I know Case is part of a broader cyber domain ontology project that's transitioning to become a Linux Foundation community project, um, thanks to unanimous affirmation from the Case Community Governance Committee. Is it the plan that this will encourage more adoption across both commercial and open source developers? And if so, how do you anticipate that happening? So yes, it's an exciting milestone for the community to be you know, transitioning a community-driven effort to this, this larger uh, cyber domain ontology project under the Linux Foundation, which has uh, a, a, a various other, in addition to the Linux operating system, uh, they're, they're kind of the uh, the holders of a lot of major open source projects. And by becoming a part of that ecosystem, which is used within 
both the private and public sectors, the, the open source stacks of software, we do have a bit more, I think, visibility and ability to plug into other efforts, but fundamentally it will improve uh, our ability to do fundraising and start to put some, uh, let's say some money into the, the process, which up until now has been largely voluntary or uh, really donated time by the community. What, what we ultimately, I think, can expect is not just for CASE and UCO to thrive, but the vision of this effort was to bring other cyber domains into this overarching cyber domain ontology. Mm -hmm. So supply chain risk management, uh, alignment with CTI and trying to, for example, align with the STIX standard and create a much more cohesive, uh, a, a common, a culture of kind of common understanding, not just for cyber investigation, but for the cyber domain and improve cybersecurity and our ability to be resilient against the growing threats uh, uh, more so than we are now. And, and perhaps uh, we can start to grow in areas that we haven't foreseen, but ultimately we're just trying to create a, a kind of a fertile ground for collaboration and developing this, this culture of common understanding. On that note, uh, at a, a webinar in September, you spoke about the Linux Foundation being neutral international ground to develop mm. case in the UCO. I wanted to find out more about what that means in particular. Well, for a number of uh, years, we were trying to, the, the case and UCO community were thinking about becoming nonprofit and to do, to do something like that, you have to pick you know, a place, right? So right. If, if we, became a nonprofit in the US, then that creates some intellectual property challenges for folks outside of the US and vice versa. And we tried navigating uh, that and it just, it we couldn't find a, a, a viable solution until a Linux foundation came uh, and, and said, well, they've figured this out for, for many different projects and can hold the intellectual property in a way that's uh, I think friendly, so neutral and is not, uh, creating any sort of barriers to entry or barriers to use anywhere in the world by any organization. Okay. So truly open source and, and collaborative. Having said that, um, I've been, uh, you know, as, as we've been looking at and covering some of the existing EU-based projects like Low Card for Mobile, uh, the Netherlands Forensic Institute's Hanskin project, uh, how does CASE or would CASE fit with or enhance projects like those um, as well as independent academic research? That's a that's an excellent question. It's something that, uh, in fact, I'll, you know, I'll start with NFI's Hanskin because they've been a founding uh, yeah. kind of contributor to the case UCO effort uh, with with a lot of, I think, influence from their experience in build, building their data model. But they're now really focusing and investing in the coming year on implementing case in their in, in their Hanskin system and what that what that amounts to is the ability to export data in a common format and to import data from other tools that support case. And so you have then the uh, much more powerful ability to, I mean, Hanskin itself is very powerful in, in as a system with a lot of capabilities and a lot of provenance information within the system. When they export that, it's, you're, pulling data out from in, in PDF format or in some formats that are useful for, let's say, court presentation, but to make it interoperable with other systems and, and really have a two-way bi-directional flow between or tools, organizations, countries that are working together in joint operations, doing that at machine speed is what the common language of case enables. And so that's really where the benefits, the main benefits come. But there's another aspect that um, we're really starting now to bring, bring to the community, which is the analysis and inference part. So formalizing how inferences, evidence-based inferences are represented. By doing that, you start to get people to think about their process of, in a bit more of a formal way, where hmm. right now we don't necessarily, in the digital forensic science, uh, we don't do this in a, let's say, a consistent, we don't interpret our digital evidence in a consistent or even common standardized way. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that we'll get to that point as a result of the case, but it creates some uh, discipline and some rigor to have to represent your inferences in a, in a formalized way. 
And so you, we're, we're created, we've created an inference concept that is flexible enough to support anyone's uh, approach, but to get people to really put it out there instead of it happening just in the brain uh, and coming out as a conclusion without some transparency into how that happened, we formalized how that work, works. And I, I, I know that the Hanskin developers have been looking at building this type of inference and evaluation into their tools. So we're, we're going to be collaborating with them to see how those concepts can be made useful in practice. Uh, with the four mobile, uh, they, they're working on some standardization, also in training for, for mobile device analysis. And so we, we've been collaborating to figure out how case can fit into this. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a work in process, and it really is dependent on ultimately their deliverables, that they, but they have tools uh, that, they're, you know, that they're focused on. And some of those tools and the developers of those tools are involved in the case community. So trying to figure out ways to create this, when you have a, an ontology or you've defined your concepts as a community, it's a common language. And that we, that's something we've lacked to date. And so that can perhaps have some use in a training context or in some of the tool, uh, the tool, the tool uh, testing context that that Four Mobile is working on. With Lockard, they're focused more on the uh, kind of the, the storage and, and ex ex the, the, what I would call kind of the the management of the data. And yeah. Case can provide a metadata layer on top of that. And we've actually developed a we developed a proof of concept with, that was it was it was uh, blockchain based, right. which is what Lockard part of what Lockard, Lockard pr provides. And so we're trying to provide the tooling to allow anyone in the community for any purpose that they have to make use of the, the, the collective effort of the case community. Okay, okay. Like I said at the beginning, it covers a lot and there's a steep learning curve. My recommendation is come participate, but define your problem first because you can't swallow mm -hmm. this whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On that note, um, one other thing that you mentioned in September is uh, the project is moving from Confluence to the very popular GitHub for better transparency and participation. And then going back to what you were saying earlier about uh, adopters and developers, uh, the website lists four roles, including ontologists, mappers, and discussers, as well as adopters. Um, what does each involve? And then how can practitioners and developers determine the most appropriate fit for them? So just to kind of give some background on the, the, the we've always used GitHub as the repository okay. for the, uh, the results of work. And there's, there's a, lot, a lot in there in terms of being able to see the work that's ongoing, but some of the workflow that had really was kind of proposal development for new concepts or filling gaps in the current standard were happening in a development environment, in, in, in Confluence. That, was was somewhat kind of restricted just in terms of being able to keep track of uh, you know, who needed access to what to make sure that they, they could get the work done. What we realized in moving to, to the Linux Foundation, but also as we grew, was that that wasn't scalable. And also, it's not as inclusive as we want to be. And the, just in discussions with the Linux Foundation, they said, well, don't you want anybody to be able to come with a proposal that's kind of formed that you can consider? And so, yes, we want this federated model mm -hmm. and we couldn't keep up with all the new ideas that people were coming with uh, mm -hmm. kind of proposals. We said, okay, go develop it. We'll help you, but do it in your GitHub repository or, or collectively as a working group. Mm -hmm. And by federating it, we increase our scalability and then people can come with more fully formed proposals, not just an idea, but we have a, a particular set of requirements for the proposals. They can come with it uh, for comment and review. And so it streamlines the process a lot more and it's much more transparent because you don't have to then have access to GitHub. I'm sorry, to Confluence. You just have to have access to GitHub and, and you're, you're, you're good to go. One of the things we are still using some of the workflow management within the, the, the Atlassian suite with Jira and Confluence is to just track the workflow of, of new, new issues, new proposals, making sure that it follows a consistent process and it's documented so that everyone feels like and knows that they can 
get a fair consideration for any proposal they bring and get comments back from the broader community, which is really a kind of a huge side benefit of all of this is the collaboration that grows between people in our community. And they come up with other ideas that they go and collaborate on. Uh, it's really, it's really a, an exciting thing to see, to be a part yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Um, it. Can you give examples of the kinds of proposals that people are coming up with? Like, like how are they arriving at them? Um, and, um, you know, what kinds of, I guess, I guess as, um, as people are listening and they might be interested in getting involved, like what, how, how is their mm -hmm. workflow feeding some of these um, uh, proposals and, and uh, what kinds of things are, are people in the community coming up with? Well, just to give you uh, one example, coming from the telecommunications side of things and uh, seeing more data com coming from cell towers and, and let's say call detail records, a particular group of the community needs that information in case format to, to correlate with data from other sources, from mobile devices and uh, computers. We, we have a group now working on proposals for, for some of that data. Another example is that so, so many of us in the community said we need to represent the output of machine learning. Now, uh, machine learning is being applied to uh, digital evidence in a variety of ways. We need to be able to represent the output of that. But that's quite uh, a, that's a big uh, ground. It's kind of quite a broad scope to cover. And so we re realized in talking through it that there are some things that you need to represent, but ultimately what the output is, it's an, in, it's an inference on the evidence. And that's where this inference concept came from. And we developed, collectively developed a, this inference uh, concept proposal that now is uh, well developed and we're starting to implement. So it, it ranges from just representation of certain data types that parts of the members of the community need mm -hmm. to more this more, let's say, analysis focused and uh, advanced uh, the inference and reasoning side of things that once we can connect all of those things together with the tools, it's, I think, going to elevate our ability to find data and reason on that data across, across incident response, digital forensics, uh, the, the whole range of the cyber, from our perspective, the cyber investigation process. Okay. From SOC to, to court, we would say. <laughs> All right, it sounds fascinating. I can't wait to see um, how it evolves from here. Yeah, so so the evolution in the next year is going to be fairly accelerated. And so I would okay. say that we're expecting a lot of uh, more momentum, people joining some of this federated development I mentioned, but also the, the, the momentum that we're, we're looking for through the Linux Foundation and some of the collaboration that comes with, with other initiatives that they have. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we have a busy 2022 and welcome all comers. Exciting. All right. Well, Owen, thank you again for joining us on the Forensic Focus podcast to talk about it all. Thank you, Krista. My pleasure. And yeah, right. let Thanks. me know if you want me to come back. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcription along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. Stay safe and well.